Hello, everybody. Um, a very happy Saturday afternoon to you, or Saturday evening in some cases. Um, massive welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Gemma, um, and I'll be hosting today's event. This is our fourth Sputnik Industry Notes event, and I'm uh, really pleased and um, feel massively privileged to introduce to you um, two wonderful artists. Um, who are going to speak to us today. Um, so off the bat, I'm really sorry, we have lost one of our artists, Duncan Stewart, somewhere in cyberspace. So I'm hoping that he will arrive <laughs> at some point. But before then, um, I'd like to introduce Namako and Duncan uh, and John to you. Um, they, uh, I've had the privilege of chatting to both of them over the last week or so, and um, you're in for a real treat. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, so we're going to start off today. I'm going to introduce uh, Namako to you first, um, and uh, we're going to do it through one of her pieces of work, actually. So um, you're going to get to see that in a minute. Um, before you um, is a piece called Keep Watch Because You Know the Day or the Hour. Um, because you do not know the day or the hour. Keep Watch Because You Do Not Know the Day or the Hour. Uh, Namako uh, Chan Takahashi is a Singaporean interdisciplinary artist and painter with a really phenomenal CV. Uh, training originally in law, she later moved to the USA to study uh, at the Art Students League uh, of New York. She then returned to Singapore in 2002 to pursue a career in painting and teaching. Winning the Painter of the Year from UOB in 2006, she is also the principal of Singapore's first official Hawaiian hula dance school. And most recently, she's been working on a fantastic series called 10,000 Profiles, as well as encouraging many to paint with her in her Freedom Birds project during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, uh, Namako, without further ado, I'd just like to pass over to you and say a huge welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Uh, would you mind just talking to us a little bit about this piece of work and about yourself? Sure. Thanks so much for having me and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so this um, is part of an exhibition that I did a couple of years ago, and um, it's uh, basically uh, the parables, and uh, this one is about the ten virgins. Uh, this is the point of time when the master comes back, and uh, he summons all the virgins to come in uh, to the wedding hall or the wedding banquet to... Um, um, enjoy his wedding and uh, the virgins that did not trim their lamps or have any oil uh, they were stuck and of course the virgins that uh, did uh, make preparations they were able to go right in um, so this is part of the, the exhibition that I I think it was 2007 and uh, there are a couple of other parables that I also um, tried to talk about in in visual form Fantastic. Thank you so much, Namako. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I, I, I really love this piece. I think um, the imagery is amazing. The lighting is, is fantastic. Um, and I really encourage you, if you get a chance to go and check out the, um, the entire series, series entitled Parables, it's wonderful. Um, I'm now going to very briefly introduce John again through one of the And the piece that I'm going to show you is called uh, Lemons and Bottle. Um, he, John specialises in contemporary oil painting and he's exhibited internationally uh, and is represented by many galleries in the UK and the USA. As well as teaching at Newland School of Art, his work is a collision of classical and digital aesthetic, bringing perceived traditions of traditional oil painting techniques into a contemporary visual language, embracing both subjects and the materials of his work. He specialises in still life portraiture and in figure landscapes. Uh, and his specialized style unites his subjects. Currently, John is rescheduling a solo exhibition at the Fine Art Commissions Gallery, uh, canceled due to COVID, and working on some stunning still life pieces in his studio in Cornwall. Uh, so John, over to you. Would you mind just introducing yourself to us a little bit through this piece? Yeah, hello everyone. And thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here and to chat about art. What fun on a Saturday afternoon. Um, yeah, so this painting is, I suppose, a, quite kind of a typical of the kind of thing that I do. 
I, I work with still life, um, but I also do landscapes and kind of figurative paintings as well. But still life is quite, um, well, firstly, it's, it's, it's very convenient because you can just set it up here in the studio and do it. You know, you don't have to kind of go out into the, the wind and the rain or you don't have to have anyone else to kind of interact with. So it's, it's, it's kind of easy in that sense. But what I like about um, still life really is the the kind of in I like um, taking sort of ordinary subjects and focusing on them and almost in quite like a meditative way just analyzing all the intricacies and um, the shapes and so often it's the case that things are more kind of complicated or um, intrinsically more interesting than like a quick cursory look and I mean for this particular uh, subject itself um, I, I suppose I don't know quite what it would have been but it would have just that, that would have been the attraction other than really the light and um, just simple colour and tonal relationships. Um, I, something that I've noticed about um, nearly all of the subjects that I work with, um, whether it's a landscape or a still life, um, I'm kind of looking for something that's quite reflective and um, contemplative. And there's always a certain quietness that um, I'm looking for really. And uh, yeah, I've definitely noticed that as kind of being a, a running theme. And any, anything that I suppose it, it's an aim to try to kind of evoke big, bigger themes about existence, bigger themes about meaning and truth and all these lofty philosophical ideas and find subject themes like that through very normal subjects like a bottle and some lemons. Uh, so whether it achieves that or not, I don't know, uh, but that's kind of, I suppose, the aim in a way. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, John. I, I think, I, I think very similarly. I love still life for that, um, the the moment that it gives the viewer the opportunity to stop and to consider something in, in just that moment of still. I think I, I, I think still life particularly is so powerful in that way, um, and I, that definitely comes through very much in your work. Um, Thank you. We're going to move on and I've, I've got a bit more of a question for both of you. So thank you so much for that introduction. I've also just heard news that Duncan is on his way. So hopefully he'll be here at some point. Um, but I would like to ask you both actually uh, a, a bit more of a kind of um, question about some of the subjects that surround your work, because um, I'm very aware looking at, at your works, there, there is very much a theme that, that seems to come into play. Um, both of you have subjects within your work which seem to keep you keep coming back to um and i wonder really what draws you to these things so namako i might ask you first but you seem very much to be very passionate about people and um and portraits that, and and really it be invested in people and this comes through in all of your work and and i wonder whether you first of all would agree with that but also why is it that you you feel kind of drawn to these things what is it about them well you're absolutely right i've always been drawn to people and uh you know someone asked me um if you had if you had a choice of what kind of superpower like an x-man superpower to have i'd really love to be invisible so that i can watch people without being seen <laughs> and like that's kind of creepy but <laughs> that really is <laughs> my wish for a superpower because i just love watching people i love interacting um i i think um since an early age because um i i'm of um my parents are of uh mixed culture so my mom is from japan and my dad uh is a straight spawn chinese uh so a chinese but born who's born in southeast asia so um, malacca singapore indonesia that region so having two kinds of cultures and uh, of course I kind of did a lot of growing up in Boston. So um, like zipping between the three, I just, I just love watching how people interact and the differences, the cultural differences and as a kid um, and even coming back, it's like just 
imagining that I'm an alien landing on Earth and just watching people and how they how they do things, how they interact. Um, I, I, I just love that. But um, yeah, you're right. I do, um, I do think that people are community and people are the most important. And um, it's kind of weird for an introvert because I am kind of an introvert, a very, uh, <laughs> a very bad introvert. I, if I could, this, this lockdown has been really great for me because I don't have to go out. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I'm making light of the situation. It's, it's really terrible, but uh, I, I really do prefer being all alone um, on my own. But um, God has given me a great capacity, a greater capacity to be with people and to love people. And um, every year, I, I notice that He just gives me more. So, um, and my prayer every day is to for my heart to increase so that I love people more. So I, I think it's working. Every day, I I find myself loving people more and more. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I've been fascinated with uh, fascinated with people and and uh, uh, not just interacting with them, but um, uh, their own journeys, their own lives, and uh, that's part of the reason why I love profiles because they're not looking at me; they're just off on their own. <laughs> they're in their own world, and I'm just there <laughs> to capture it. So, um, yeah, I think I'll talk about the profiles a little bit later. Thank you. And I mean, I agree. I think looking at your body of work, there is a real empathy that comes through in, in all the ways that you paint. And um, it's, re it's really powerful. I can, yeah, see your, your empathy and your compassion for people. And, and I think that that's, it, does, it does change you as a viewer looking at that. It's phenomenal. Um, just to say at this point uh, to everyone who's watching, if you've got any questions for Namako, please pop them in the chat. Just um, place them in the chat and uh, wonderful Sarah will kind of sift through them and we'll ask some of them. But if you've got specific questions uh, for either Namako or John, or if you've got questions that you'd like to, to put to both of them, please pop them in the chat and, um, and we'll have a, a, a time in a few moments actually just to be able to put your questions to them. That'd be brilliant. Um, John, I'm going to pass the same question to you, really. Uh, again, this idea of themes that you keep coming back to. For you, definitely still life is so strong within your work, but also very much themes of nature. Uh, you really draw on the kind of beauty of that. And, and I wonder what it is in your work that, that draws you back again and again to these subjects. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose um, in some senses I... Um, like I, I sort of recognize that nearly all of my subjects, you know, whether it's still life or figurative or landscape, they're deeply um, classical themes, some subjects that people have been painting for hundreds of years. And I suppose when I was at art school, um, you know, there was a time when I was thinking, oh, like I, I, want, I did want to paint representational paintings. I've always been interested in that kind of thing. And, and as well as kind of combining that with um, abstract uh, processes and stuff. But I remember kind of thinking, well, what, 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 because I was always kind of interested in the language of painting and not so much the actual kind of content. It's so often, I think it's, it's the way in which something is communicated that makes it particularly interesting. Um, you know, even, um, well, I mean, it's, it's like a poem in a way. The poem can kind of be about anything, but the language used, the words chosen, the rhythm, um, that is what makes it um, really interesting. No, so that's not to say that the subject is completely um, like meaningless at all. It's just the combination of the two is, is really, it really matters. So, yeah, and so I was, I was at, art school and I kind of thought well should I like just kind of looking around and it's like well my iPhone like should I paint my iPhone or um, like a crisp packet or something like that and and I found myself kind of just I mean I started just doing some cups and then and then I and and some pot plants and I had a quite and at the time I wasn't hugely thinking about what these subjects were um, what what they symbolically meant or anything like that. It was more just a, a means to making a painting. Um, but interestingly, um, 
I, at the time I had an interesting um, tutorial and we kind of ended up talking about how um, that you're, there's always meaning to to an artwork. In fact, it's it's pretty much impossible to make a painting that doesn't mean anything. And um, like, so even if it is like cups or um, still life or I don't know, I, I like the idea that um, that there's um, there's sort of philosophical and existential meaning there, and it's a case of unearthing it. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of drawn towards um, these kind of classical themes, really, um, and and it's the kind of a cliche, but it's it's much to do with how the light lands on things. Light is is really, in some ways, the um, one of my main subjects, whether that's light landing on on a profile or of a face or on, on a, some flowers or, and it's in search of that kind of quiet uh, beauty, that like a, a moment of transcendence um, that, that you can easily miss. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah, very much. Uh, if, if, um, if you get a chance to have a look at John's work or if you've seen it before, you'll know that light is is phenomenally rendered in his work uh, across all of it and it is this kind of collision of this very everyday object and the light hitting it that that really does pull together this kind of like you say this moment of transcendence it is it is amazing i think we've just also got a new face i think it's duncan hello duncan <laughs> hello <laughs> I Last think you're but hopefully on... not least. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I've been I've been trying. I just it seems Africa geographically even means you go slower and further away from Zoom. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well, it is so, so nice to see your face with us. I'm gonna straight in, Duncan, and I'm gonna introduce you straight away if that's okay. <laughs> Guys, this is Duncan Stewart. Uh, all the way from South Africa. He is a phenomenal painter. Um, I know I've said that about all of our panellists, but it really, really is true. Um, so a massive welcome to Duncan. Uh, Duncan, as I've said, is a South African painter, sculptor and teacher. Originally, he trained as a graphic designer. Duncan went on to expand his practice, studying fine art in Italy at Lorenzo de Medici Institute. After several years teaching painting and sculpture in Italy, he then returned to South Africa to pursue the arts full time. Most recently, his stream of consciousness journaling and collaborations with Dr. Gibbon Bosa uh, in the Future Studies Project are fantastic, uh, really engaging and exploring uh, various AI impacts on the arts. Um, we've attached here the image, wor uh, Worship the Hope Giver um, and uh, Duncan, uh, would you mind just talking to us just for a few moments about this piece and, and just introducing yourself? Great, thanks so much, Gemma. Hi, everyone. Um, really honored to be part of, of this group. Um, this piece, I, 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 um, I was meditating on, on, on where it came from. And it's actually, we had some severe fires, uh, wildfires along our coastal region about two, three years ago. Uh, that destroyed um, towns and an enormous amount of vegetation. And so that, that there was some, obviously some striking footage and imagery from that. And, uh, and I, did the, um, I, I did a few pieces uh, just in response to that, just the, what fire can do and the, the, the life that comes from, you know, things burning and dying. Uh, but what the, the sort of the, the, the repeating or the, the recurring image was of these dead, these trees that were just completely burnt. And so that's continued. I've got a couple of other of pieces that were related. I posted them on the Slack um, on my um, link. Uh, all the pieces that were related to this one was about third or fourth in line. Um, and, I, and I called it, um, uh, What's it? Worship for the praise giver, because essentially on the left, top left, you, you would have all the the, the world that's burnt uh, and suffering, and then 
on the right, you have life coming and there's, for me, um, uh, there are these, these two, uh, we exist in a world of, of death and of life. So to the right hand side, you would see the cypress trees and then maybe this eternal well uh, of living water in front of it. And below that you have uh, sort of demarcated, you have this, uh, you have us, you know, God's creation created in his amazing image. And where do we go and, and who do we worship? So I, I didn't actually think too consciously about, I wanted to, uh, you know, reach a, a sort of a Christian narrative per se, although well, obviously with the Holy Spirit, we always, we're always thinking thoughts after what we understand in scripture. Um, but essentially, so I think it's a, I think it's people coming to those two places of things being destroyed and burnt by fire. And then the other hope that we have in Christ, which is life um, and, uh, and, and worshiping of the one who gives us hope. And so that's kind of what's happening for me as I've thought about it after the fact, but it's one, like I said, of a couple of different works inspired by um, some terrible fires. Yeah, amazing. Um, Duncan, I've asked this question to the others already, but um, I know obviously you do some commission work, but, but the work that you do of, of your own, um, you are often very interested in, in the elements and in particularly water seems to be quite a recurring theme. Um, I wondered for you, what, what is it, what themes do draw you and why do you think you keep coming back to these particular things within your work? Yeah, I, th I think because they, firstly, they, 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 especially with water, it's life, you know, there's, without, you know, <laughs> I always love this, that great book by um, Thomas Traherne, who I think was a 16th century uh, priest, and uh, he talks about the centuries, and he talks about um, things that are most valuable, God made in most abundance, you know, things that are most rare, should be least precious, like gems and gold and that whereas oxygen and water are like the most it makes sense that god would make things that are most precious in most abundance and i've always loved that because it throws the world's economy on its head you know um so for me water has that intangible aspect of of we so deeply intrinsically connected to it in terms of life we cannot live without oxygen for a few minutes but with water Water, you know, a few, I think it's three days. I don't know what the limit is that you can go without water. But um, so there's so much life in it. And then also it's nature is always shifting and changing and reflecting and carrying. And so there's so much life in it for me. And I've always enjoyed water. I love, um, you know, this morning I was paddling on the ocean. Uh, so the water is a big part of my environment and, and just my groundedness in the in the in the on the planet that god has placed me on at this season is deeply connected with water um so i think i think it's always a close friend uh like i would imagine the holy spirit and and uh and i'm always using it to try and to push it a bit further whether literally and now more abstractly to find something that resonates with people you know it's a common bridge everyone understands water at some level, whether they're thirsty or whether it's metaphorical or whatever. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll be honest, Duncan, right there, a slight amount of jealousy arose in me that you've been out on the water this morning <laughs> <laughs> from here in the UK. Uh, and particularly, I'm in Birmingham. I'm very far away from water sources <laughs> and it's cold. <laughs> so yeah, brilliant. Anyone is most welcome if you come to South Africa, happy to take you paddling. Amazing. Fantastic. What's the time there, Duncan? <laughs> it is half past, half past four in the afternoon. Okay, great. <laughs> Brilliant. So uh, just to let you all know, um, uh, the, the, um, the viewers, we've got Namaco and it's um, probably about 10.30 in the evening there. We've got Duncan, it's four in the afternoon. And then for me and John, it's uh, just past lunchtime. <laughs> so we've got some questions coming in and I can tell that there are lots of... Um, practitioners themselves because there's some really technical questions coming in so um john i'm going to pose this first one to you if that's okay um so here we go in contemporary art there is often an impression that people should move beyond painting and uh, pursue more conceptual methods 
what is it about painting that really grips you and you think is still a very important kind of dialogue within the art world? Oh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, the, the assumption of moving beyond this whole kind of thing. It's a bit of an interesting narrative that certainly implies development, but it seems a strange thing to me to equate development with um, letting go of one of the traditions that have brought so much joy and, and have inspired such amazing books and you know it's it's any kind of definition of um, progression that kind of throws the baby out with the bathwater I'm I tend to be a little skeptical of and um, I think that there are some for me at least, and I think also for many people, painting is a form of language that speaks to the soul, really. And, you know, I mean, what, what, what is it and why does that happen? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's incredibly fun to do. Um, and anyone, you know, who has done it, we, we've got a, a little daughter and we've just recently bought some crayons, but we haven't actually started it yet. But you know, like, whenever a kid like, starts drawing and creating, it's, it's so fun. Like the, the mystery of, of something creating, being created and formed right in front of you is incredibly exhilarating. But yeah, I mean, I think that a large amount, most, I think lots and lots of people re resonate with paintings and it's only a kind of, I feel like the, the kind of narrative of moving beyond it is actually only coming from a very, very tiny minority that um, seems to me to be missing the point. It's like, if you can't see, if, yeah. So I don't resonate with that kind of idea, I suppose. And I, I just, it's, it's most, it, it's a motivation of just love and enjoyment. It, it's fun I, it, to make it and to look at them afterwards. <laughs> Fantastic. John, I'm gonna stick with you for a moment actually, because I've we've got a couple of questions coming in um, in regards to um, specifically the way that you bring together this digital and this kind of traditional within your work. So I've got a question here. Um, how do you create your digital distor distortions are they done digitally uh, initially uh, or are they painted freehand? Like, uh, I suppose more into the technicals of, of what you do. Um, where did the digital influ influence come from? And then, you know, how do you go about making that into a piece? Yeah, um, where it came from, I suppose, I've always been interested in just exploring widely the, the language of painting and, kind of just open-ended exploration and what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And almost in some ways built up, like I'd always write in my sketchbook, like different technical things. And over time, it would be a case of putting all of these ideas and putting them all together, really. And I think that there's something for me quite interesting about um, well, the disruption and what that means and kind of maybe seeing through a bit of a broken glass or something like that. But I mean, in terms of the actual practicalities, I'm using, I'm using brushes um, and you, palette knives as well. And as, as I'm working, I'm kind of maybe intentionally abstracting it and then working back into it. Um, and that, that sort of process, really. I think painting, what makes a successful painting often is a combination of many opposite ideas. So within the application, have, having some areas of thick paint, some areas of thin transparent areas, some areas where the brushwork is loose, other areas where it's just really tight. Um, so, and, and the edge work as well. So soft and hard edges, um, brushes and palette knives, all of these kinds of opposites rolled into one. And um, yeah, to kind of try to create almost like a hybrid combination of all these different things. Amazing, thank you. 
Fantastic. Namako, I'm going to um, ask the next question to you, actually, if that's OK. Again, it's um, coming from the idea of your methods, really. Um, so for you, Namako, obviously, you've been painting for a very long time. And actually, I know that your piece for UOB, you did from memory. Is that true? Oh, no, it was not from memory. The model okay, was right I read in front that of me. Somewhere. <laughs> you know, Brilliant. Sometimes I give interviews and then they don't really get it right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, you might, I think you might have read it uh, from uh, yeah, an interview that, that got a bit astray. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, whether from memory or not, actually, the question mm -hmm. is, um, what methods do you use to achieve proportions in your portraits? And obviously, I mean, ten, uh, your 10,000 portraits is <laughs> it's a real example of this. I'll, I'll let Namako talk to you um, and explain the perimeters in which she does these portraits, but they are phenomenal. And so for you, what what is this process? How do you, how have you learned these techniques? And, and yeah, over to you. Um, so the person who asked the question, I think uh, you must have had experience with uh, uh, figurative drawing or painting and or uh, it's really, really difficult to get the proportion sometimes. Um, and uh, I knew I needed the tools to know how to break things down. So that's why I went to the Art Students League uh, that's in New York. And um, for five years, I, that's all I did. I just painted people for 13, 14 hours a day. Uh, seven, you know, six days a week for five years. And, uh, and, I, and I got a little bit better at it. <laughs> um, but um, out of all that uh, grunt work, um, I've gleaned a quick, for me, quick uh, way to do it. So I'm talking to people who have done portraiture before. Um, and um, this is uh, an adaptation of what Daniel Green taught. So I, I had a, a lot of a, a few teachers um, and Daniel Green, uh, he just passed, um, I think this year. Um, and uh, he's an amazing portrait painter. He painted Princess Diana and all kinds of people, famous people. So he says that um, to quickly get proportions, um, let's say the face, uh, you get, and uh, I'm just gonna use my own face. You get the hairline to the um, brow um, and then you have the brow from the bottom of the nose, and then you have the bottom of the nose to the bottom of the chin. And um, uh, I think an uh, easy way to understand this is if you are not wearing your glasses and you see a friend from really, really far away, you can recognize that friend because of the proportions of the face and not because of any particular detail, but it's basically the proportions. And that happens in the entire body as well. Um, so. Uh, like let's say a person with a very high forehead, this would be longer. And then maybe a person with a, sh a short nose from here to here, that would be short. And then, you know, people with huge chins, like, you've, you know, <laughs> I, I know someone with a very large chin, it was really fun to paint him. <laughs> and so this portion would be really, really long. And it's just playing around with those, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess ratios, uh, but to get that, would be, I mean, that's just theory, right? Uh, to how, how do you take your paintbrush and actually do it or take your pencil or whatever. Um, so what I like to do um, is take the nose first. So I work my way from the inside of the face to the outside. Um, and if there's a model in front of you, uh, take a straight uh, thing up and down, maybe a pencil or a mall stick or um, any kind of straight thing. and. Uh, from the nose, you take your proportions from there. So is this part bigger, uh, I think, taller than the nose, longer than the nose? Um, and is this part longer than the nose? So you kind of like gauge uh, from the inside out. But um, as to how much that has, that's a trial and error. And I find myself uh, working through those difficulties. So I, I don't get it straight off the bat. And uh, I do my sketches in 30 minutes. So um, within that 30 minute, um, period of time, I keep on rubbing and realigning, and so yeah, it's just not a, it's not a, uh, I, I guess it's not an immediate thing. You just have to work it through, um, but for uh, a very practical way to deal with proportions is you take something and then you take the other thing and compare it with that something. So I like to take the nose. If I'm doing a hand, I like to take the middle finger and compare everything to the middle finger. Um, so it's 
uh, my method, but um, I mean, you're free to use it. It's, uh, it works for me. Fantastic. Um, so I, I guess following on that, we've had some questions about kind of stages of your artwork. So like you said, you like to do sketches and get mm -hmm. those done quickly. But for you, for a piece like the one that we saw earlier, how long will that have taken you from start to finish? Uh, what are the stages that you go through in that? Um, yeah, talk to us a little bit more about that. Oh, so the piece that you just saw, um, the Parable of the Ten Virgins, um, paintings like that, and that's pretty large. That's um, one point something meter, I, I don't remember offhand. Uh, so uh, I would say the largest I've ever painted was about two meters across. Um, and that kind of size it normally takes me about a hundred hours and a hundred hours is probably about three, four months if I'm working on a few, a uh, couple of paintings uh, at a time. So uh, that whole, but I, I, that, that was a show that I had to produce in a very short period of time. So um, it, it took a little bit less time and I got a little bit less sleep. But if I'm going at a really sane pace, then it would be about three, five months uh, for a painting that size. And uh, um, the 10,000 profile project that is purely sketches because it's 30 minute oil paintings uh, and on the spot. So the person is in front of me, I could be on the street. I could be in front of a, I did paint in front of a cheesecake factory, which I really loved because I love cheesecake. Um, so, you know, I could be anywhere and uh, I need to get that person to stay with me for, for 30 minutes, which is, you know, if I had no more than 30 minutes, that's the, um, that's the limit to um, uh, the amount of time that a passerby would be willing to spend with me. So um, 30 minutes, that's all I have. And uh, I just do a quick, um, very thin sketch, um, thinly applied oils. And um, the main thing is to get the proportions right. Uh, so it kind of starts like that for a finished piece, like a um, like a painting that I'm producing for a show, an exhibition. Um, so from there, with a very thinly applied paint, um, I build on it. And uh, it's, it's kind of like what John said, uh, some parts are left really thin, like a very thin application of paint, but some parts are really built up. So I really work on some parts of it, um, building up the paint uh, almost to impasto. So it's really thickly applied um, application of paint. And uh, the rest, I, I kind of, I keep coming back to it um, and oiling it up because sometimes it sinks in. So maybe the dark colors or the oxides, the brown colors, they tend to sink in. So I, all I do is I just oil it up and um, kind of bring it to life, but I don't add any more paint. So some parts of the painting will be kept just like a sketch. It's very, very thin. You can sometimes see the canvas through it. Um, and some parts are really built up. So um, at the end of the 100 hours, the approximate 100 hours, I would have um, a, a painting where um, some parts of it are just like how I started, uh, a very thinly applied layer of paint, um, nothing much. And then the rest of the places, like maybe the lights, uh, that would be where I really build up the paint and try and mold with the light. Um, so I, I guess there's no hard and fast rule, like there's no real formula um, of how I attack it because every painting um, gets done a bit differently, but uh, that's kind of the main trajectory. Great, thank you. We've got a lot, quite a lot of questions coming in in relation to um, the panels relationship between your work and your face. So um, I'm going to ask kind of, I'm kind of gonna try and conglomerate these questions together. And Duncan, if we can go to you first, that'd be brilliant. Um, so this question is coming from Jennifer. I'm interested to know how um, each artist's relationship with God affects or influences the work they create. Um, and has it always been the case or were there any turning points on this journey is there a story about a particular piece that they've created that reminds them of a specific aspect or moment of their relationship with God? So I guess kind of generalizing all of that, what is it that being an artist and being a Christian, where are those points of collision? Um, yeah, so Duncan, to you first, if that's okay. Sure. Um, for, for me, I never had the desire or the appetite or the courage, because I think it takes enormous courage to be an artist. 
And uh, I've always loved drawing, but I never, I never saw myself as an artist. I uh, come from a very traditional lawyer, banker, academic family. And, um, but, when I, but when I was saved, when God graciously saved me, I was already, I'd studied graphic design. I was in advertising in that sort of industry. And um, I, I, think, I think what it gave me was that I no longer lived as Paul says, but Christ lives in me, you know, and the, the life I live, I live by faith in the son of God. And, and so I began to get courage for this, for this desire to be an artist. And so it was around about that time, I was about 22. I just got saved. I did some um, Bible studies uh, for two years at one of our local institutions. And in all of that, it was about seeking your purpose, your plan. And at the same time, I was um, exploring after hours, my desire to paint and draw. And they were all sort of converging. So I can say that as I found my identity in Christ, Christ deposited within me a desire for his kingdom and a desire to use the gifts and to develop the gifts that is given me. And so that gave me the courage to then go and study and and there was some incredible fruit, as in uh, successful sales, which for an artist in the beginning is in tremendously encouraging. And I thought, well, oh, maybe, maybe I can actually survive like this. So, um, you know, all of those things coming together were confirmations and the kindness of God to say, I've called you for my glory, I've called you for a purpose. And, um, and so I suppose, uh, then it's, and, and, now, and now the journey has been persevering and walking with God as best as we each can in our individual ways, as intimately and faithfully as we can, with all of the sanctification that comes along the journey um, and how that affects our thinking. And that, that process is also affecting what I think is important to say, uh, how I want to even try and paint uh, what I want to try and paint. So, so it's, it's continually changing. I'm realizing, you know, they're, they're paintings that I can, that I can look back on and say, wow, that was ahead of its time because it's better than, than I expected for that time. But then there are other works that I can do now that I can think, oh, that's just got so much more um, soul to it than uh, anything I could have done with all my training up to that point, you know, 10, 15, 10 years ago. So I, I hope that answers a little bit um, the question. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Duncan. Um, yeah, absolutely brilliantly. Um, John, maybe I could pose a very similar question to you. I suppose, what, what does it mean for you to be a Christian and an artist? And I'm aware that you can ask that of any job, you know, what does it mean for you to be a lawyer and a Christian? Um, but I suppose having an, an audience, um, having people buy your work, having people look to your work for, I guess like we talked about before, that moment of peace or a, a, an opportunity to consider something in a different way. Um, how does your faith impact that? Mm, yeah, well, I mean, I think making artwork or and painting in particular is very often um, concerned with looking and perceiving reality. And Christianity and religion, those things fundamentally shape and affect how we see and perceive reality um, on big questions, big questions of identity, of meaning, of purpose and value. And artwork is mixed up and with all of those big questions. And I think it's particularly relevant um, on the subject of meaning. I think so often you know great music or something like that is is moving because it's meaningful and you know if god doesn't exist um it's predicted cosmologists say that one day the universe will expand so much it will just like obliterate <laughs> like total devastation no existence whatsoever and you think if there was absolutely nothing more to, than, um, to life than just the sheer physical existence of now, it, it, it kind of means that meaning and value kind of is, is lost in some senses, something that's so temporary, just irrefutably and utterly lost. 
and and I think that you know we we don't we we don't believe that this is all that there is as the Christian narrative is a cosmic story that God is acting out and and we of course are in it and it, it means that that meaning like uh, a type of ultimate meaning is is real it's not just um fanciful fluffy feeling it's actually rooted in in truth um and so i think that um uh, my worldview that's shaped by christianity um is affected in many ways like that and there's a video um, by William Lane Craig. Uh, he's a Christian philosopher and kind of does all these debates and stuff. But he, he has a really interesting lecture on, it's on YouTube, it's called The Meaninglessness of Life Without God, or, or maybe even The Absurdity of Life Without God. And I think it's really interesting because it just, it talks about some of these themes um, that, um, yeah, that uh, the, the questions of, of meaning and value and purpose and identity and and how without God, many of those subjects um, don't have grounding. So it's quite like a deep thing that um, uh, my belief in God shapes the way I see reality. And, um, but certainly in terms of like all the business side of things like that, I certainly want to always conduct myself with, um, you know, uh, just a, a, a type of like love and um, and and I think also just on a, a quick existential note I think that it's really helpful to know that God is with you and for you and you can trust him because it's super uncertain it's a very kind of odd way to scratch a living um, you never you never know what the future holds but you know that that um, saying is I don't know what what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. And it doesn't mean that everything will be easy, but it means that we can trust God no matter what happens. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Um, Namako, I suppose if I can pass the question over to you, but but slightly change the tack of it. Really, I think for. Um, Christian artists sometimes there is a tendency to um, feel like you must paint very Christian themes potentially and that's not something that any of you guys particularly do um, or that you need to go for an audience within Christianity which again all of you um, have seem to have have a, a much wider audience um, and you have um, a much uh, broader kind of scope to your work uh, you have a voice into cult your culture and your societies. Um, and, and first of all, that's not an easy thing to do, I don't think. There, there seems to be very few artists of faith breaking through, at least in the UK here. Um, but for you, Namako, I know that you are very passionate about community. So not only uh, do you have a voice into your, um, your culture, but actually you actively try and pursue that within your community. Uh, can you first of all talk to us a little bit about that really and then talk about how that works with your faith? Well, um, like uh, Duncan, I was saved only in my 20s. Um, I was actually 21 when I gave my life to Christ and uh, so a great part of my life before that was uh, not lived out as a follower of Christ. So um, like what John was saying, it's uh, being a follower of Christ, it really changes your worldview, changes the lens with which you see the world and interpret meaning. Um, so I think uh, right now at this point of time, um, I'm really quite passionate, um, like you said, Gemma, about uh, people around me. So the community as in um, the immediate community, the people that live um, in this country, in Singapore, um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very saddened at how um, the world is dealing with um, uh, the pandemic. I mean, uh, the second, third, fourth waves all over the world. Um, and uh, I feel like I'm in a bubble in Singapore because uh, uh, we kind of have 
sort of put a lid on it uh, for now. Well, for now, anyway, you never know. Uh, and uh, so right now, um, uh, the thing in, that's, that's really impressed upon my heart is how we can encourage people around the world. And, uh, um, and that's why I, I thought of this project of um, uh, getting at least a thousand Singaporeans to join me to play this game. We're gonna send postcards to people around the world, like physical postcards through the mail and uh, uh, encourage someone with, with something, something edifying, something encouraging, something positive. And uh, I, it doesn't have to be Christian, doesn't have to be a Bible verse. It can be something that really speaks to the heart. And uh, yeah, that's sometimes all we need to hear, um, someone reaching out to us and really speaking to our hearts. Um, so right now that's, that's really something that I, I'm really passionate about, how, how we can reach out to the world and, and not just stay in our own little bubble. Um, and I think um, the first part of the question about being a, a, a Christian and an artist, that's something that I was praying about for a long time because I wanted to be an artist since I was four and I knew that this was the only thing that I wanted to do with my life. Uh, so I was playing in the dirt. I love nature. I was always out in the soil, in the ground, uh, making mud sculptures or whatever. And I was in Boston at that time. And uh, I really uh, thought this was all that I wanted to do with my life. And, um, and then, you know, uh, coming from a very Asian, very practical background, art is not something that you want to pursue. You should pursue other things, uh, proper things. You know? So, uh, so I, I, I spent a long time uh, just trying to work things out and then putting Christianity into the mix. Like when I uh, became a follower of Christ, it just made me really, really confused. And uh, for 10 years, over 10 years, I was praying to God fervently, how am I going to reconcile all these worlds that I'm living in uh, that don't seem to be shaking hands. And um, I was working with my mentor, who's, I think he was just uh, Kimberly Kreisman. And uh, we, we worked together. I, I, I just saw her on the chat. Um, and uh, we worked through it. And she did something with me called Focus Living. And that really sorted out all the confusion. Well, not all, most of the confusion. Um, and I, it, I, it kind of congealed in my mind how to reconcile being a Christ follower, being an artist, being in the secular world, being uh, amongst church friends. And um, so that, that took a while. I don't think it's, um, that's a quick fix um, solution, but that, that really did take a, a while of wrestling. And of course, over 10 years of praying. So that was, that was pretty much how I kind of figured it out. <laughs> Amazing, lots of prayer, very important. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to ask you all a very, very quick finishing quote because I realise that we're at three o'clock. But I, I see, figure seeing as we started at five past, we might just have a tiny bit of grace with everyone. There are quite a few questions and I'm sorry that we haven't given enough time to this. But in terms of, for you guys, kind of uh, advice for people who are maybe just starting out, maybe have just finished university. Um, I'm wondering if in one sentence each, and just to give you some warning, uh, John, I'm going to start with you. So Namako has a bit of time to think about this. Um, could you give maybe one sentence of maybe advice looking back on your journey? Because I think it's very hard, maybe when you're just starting out or with each decision that you would like to have given to yourself um, looking back um, or some kind of one sentence encouragement um, for people who are maybe a bit further behind than you, but actually feel like there might be a, a place for them um, uh, to, to produce more work or something like that. So a one sentence nugget of wisdom, if that's possible. So John, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, what comes to mind first is um, pursue excellence and don't forget your first loves so don't forget why you love making art even when you're kind of faced with all kinds of art that you don't maybe resonate with like you don't have to follow the crowd and don't forget your first love of christ as well um and yeah pursue excellence <laughs> 
Brilliant, John. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. All right, Duncan, I'm coming to you now. I don't know how you're going to top that. It's over to no, you. No, I, I can't. Ditto. <laughs> but uh, I suppose I fully concur. I mean, the first, your, your, you know, Matthew 6.33, if you, you must get that thing down, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things. But I would add perseverance and, uh, and people and perseverance are two Ps. Uh, the people that you have around you in terms of community, really critical and then uh just persevering in faith that god has a plan a unique plan it relates to that quote from frankel uh for you and your art is going to look different for somebody else but yeah uh jesus first and then community and persevere fantastic hey brilliant namako over to you to finish everyone off <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> Well, to everyone who's listening in, who is going through school or has just graduated, um, I would love to encourage you to just keep on keeping on because uh, the road is going to be rough and uh, you've chosen a path that is um, not the easiest and uh, is so different uh, for each individual. So um, I would say that um, uh, you need to have a very strong backbone of prayer and to keep praying and the Holy Spirit will show you um, the way through and even when you get stuck um, sometimes you might have to be stuck for a while so the road is not going to be smooth and it's not going to be a bed of roses and my cat is very very hungry and he's biting me so I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little, um, yeah, so I've raised my knees. <laughs> so um, if, if you're um, uh, facing uh, a degree of uh, trepidation, that's completely normal. You, what you need is to have someone in your corner. And I know um, uh, if you have a soulmate or you have um, a sister or brother in Christ, and I always go to my husband, Aaron B. He's my champion he's always in my corner and he's not afraid to tell me that things are not going well or what um the, the work that i produced um wasn't as good as it could be and so he's honest with me so you need one of those at least one of those honest people who will tell you exactly how they feel um but in love um should be a christian person um a follower of christ who will know how to give you objective and uh, good advice in love, not to tear you down. So you, you get one of those friends at least and just keep on keeping on. Fantastic, thank you so much. To the whole panel, guys, you have been brilliant and feel like we could go on for another hour if I'm totally honest. Uh, Namako, John and Duncan, thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I know that we haven't uh, managed to get around to everyone's questions. We've had questions coming in from a couple of different places. Um, if we haven't, um, and you've got some questions, please feel very free, like Sarah said in the chat, to email um, the Sputnik um, and to contact us through the Sputnik website, and we'll pass the questions on to these guys. So um, please, yeah, please, if we didn't get around to um, answering yours, please do follow that up. Um, I've got just a few notices before we end. Um, firstly, um, in the rough, if you hadn't heard about that already, yeah. we're running a digital gallery of work created during lockdown. Um, if you would like to submit work to that, um, please submit it via the Sputnik website, the Sputnik office, um, or directly through the in the rough website. Um, it is a um, online exhibition and all work submitted will be um, popped up on there. So please, if you're doing some work, and again, you just want to show it to a few people, have a bit of an audience, please put it on there. Uh, we would really love to see that. We also have the Emergency Artists Fund. Uh, we know that this is a hard time at the moment for everybody and that actually many artists have lost work and lost their jobs. We've set up a fund for those um, who found uh, well-being or your ability to create significantly impacted during this time. Um, by COVID. Uh, and if you'd like to apply for a £200 grant, uh, email the Spikenick office again and briefly summarise your situation and we'll try and help as best we can. Um, 
And then finally, um, following on beautifully from what Namako said about getting that one person, um, we have um, a Sputnik Slack. So I don't know if you've been on Slack before, but it's a wonderful platform uh, just to be able to chat and share your work. And Sputnik now has our own Slack. It's uh, split into disciplines. Um, so you can find um, Christians who um, have connected in with us from all over at the UK and beyond um, who are working within your discipline. We've got a visual arts one, we've got a music one, and we've got a filmmakers one and more. Um, please go on there, please uh, join us. And it's a great place to, to, to find those one or two people who um, champion you, who give you feedback, who'll be honest. Um, it's a really great place to be. Um, a huge thank you. This is the first time that I've done one of these and it's very strange not being able to see all the participants, but I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and to the panel once more, you guys have been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs>